Hello, fellow kids, and welcome to the inaugural episode of the What is Politics podcast. So why does the world need yet another political podcast? Because we are going to fill out some of the giant gaps left by most of the other wonderful and terrible political podcasts out there. Gap number one is that most other political podcasts don't teach you how to actually do politics. Like you want rent control in your area. You want a wage increase at your workplace. How does one go about making these sorts of things happen? In the introductory video on the What Is Politics YouTube channel called What Is Politics and Why Should I Care, which you can also find on this podcast feed, we talked about how bargaining power is the key to exerting your influence over people who have official authority over you, whether it's your boss at work or your government in the public sphere or your mom. So in future episodes, we're going to focus on how ordinary people throughout history have maximized and exercised their political bargaining power to achieve their common goals. And we'll be talking to various people who are organizing and making these sorts of things happen in our time. Which brings us to gap number two. Many of us feel like the world of politics is broken and needs fixing. But before you can fix your broken car, first you need to know what a car is and you need to know how a car works, and you need to know what all of the different parts of the car are called, and you also need to have the right tools to fix it, and you need to know how to use those tools. So before you can become an effective political actor, first you need basic political literacy, which is something that is extremely rare, even among political science PhDs. And that's because politics today is almost 100% pure WURBS. A WURB is a word that I just invented, which means a word that everyone uses, but that no one really knows exactly what it means. Like, you think you sort of know what capitalism means, but do you really know what it means? Whether you dropped out of high school at age 16, or if you're a political science PhD doctor professor, if you had to sit down and write out definitions for all of the basic common political terms that you can think of, left, right, Capitalism, socialism, the market, government, ideology, democracy, class, economics, even the word politics itself, I bet that you'll mostly come up with a bunch of half-assed, confused garbage. Go ahead and try it and see what you come up with. You can see how this plays out when you read popular, journalistic, or academic texts about political subjects. Like go to a library, a place of books, and pick up three books about capitalism, written by important politicians or by important academic theorists or journalists, and see if any of them even bother to define what capitalism is. Like there's a recent book called Capitalism in America by former U.S. Chairman of the Federal Reserve Alan Greenspan, which is all about how great capitalism is and how we need to go back to that good old time capitalist spirit that made America so great back in the good old day. Greenspan is so moved and so inspired by capitalism that in all of the 200 plus pages of his book, he somehow forgets to tell us what capitalism actually is. You know something's got to be good when you get so pumped up about it that you write a whole book without even knowing what the hell you're talking about. Or maybe he does know what he's talking about, and he's choosing not to share that information with us for some reason. We'll look into that a little bit later, but while you're at the library which I know is where you are because I just told you to go there. Keep picking out books on capitalism until you manage to find three books about capitalism that actually do define what it is. Do any of the definitions match each other? Are any of them actually clear and precise or coherent? Or do they resemble the following definition? Quote, Capitalism is not just private property, nor is it just profit. Capitalism is private property and profits and some income inequality within a framework of competition and social fluidity, in which there is a great deal of independent policy determination and much movement between social classes. When it ceases to be that, in my opinion, it ceases to be capitalism. Unquote. Uh, it's like business or something? <laughs> this feeble attempt at a definition is from economist and doctor professor David McCord Wright from a 1953 radio discussion that you can find online where he's talking with hugely influential economists Milton Friedman and John Kenneth Galbraith, both of whom are authors of books about capitalism that neglect to define what capitalism is. And while Wright's own book on capitalism does offer a definition, it's even more tortured and confused than the one I just quoted. 
Now, books about socialism, pro and con, are just as bad, or worse. No definition, muddled, contradictory definitions, and lots and lots of clearly wrong definitions. Like, take a look at American Senator Rand Paul's recent book, The Case Against Socialism, where he defines socialism as, quote, government ownership of the means of production, unquote. Now, on the plus side, that's a clear and concise definition. A plus. It's also a very popular definition. And it's also a very wrong definition, at least if you care about what actual socialists believe and have believed throughout history. Paul quotes a few contemporary politicians who call themselves socialists, but who can't define what socialism is, and he makes fun of them for that. Fair enough. But beyond that, he doesn't seem particularly interested in what socialists think or what socialism is. Because if he was interested, like if he had read any important books by socialists, past or present, he'd see that for many of the most important socialist thinkers, including Karl Marx, a socialist society isn't even supposed to have a government in the sense of a state at all. And for those socialists who have called for the state to control the economy, that's traditionally been seen as a transitional measure towards a society where workers and consumers directly control the economy themselves, i.e. socialism. When the Soviet Union started turning into an economy where workers became permanent employees of the state, many socialists started decrying this as a form of capitalism, but with the state playing the role of the capitalist instead of the usual private capitalist owner. Because traditionally, a central tenet of socialism has always been that you're not supposed to have employees at all. According to most socialist thinkers, employees are to capitalism as serfs are to feudalism or as slaves are to slave society. And the whole point is to abolish these types of class distinctions, as we'll see when we discuss the history of socialism and capitalism in future episodes. Even in all of those infamous communist dictatorships like Stalin's USSR or Mao's China, the official excuse for dictatorship and for government control of the economy has always been that it's just supposed to be a temporary transitional period where the country develops enough wealth and productive capacity so that there's enough to be shared comfortably by everyone, at which point workers can finally control the economy themselves, and where the state and all of its coercive institutions are supposed to become obsolete. Now, this is a point which never seems to actually materialize in these dictatorships, but again, we'll make sense of all of this when we do episodes on socialism. The point here is that if you truly cared about arguing against an idea, well, then you'd be actually arguing against that idea instead of making up your own definition. It's really easy to win arguments when you get to make up fake definitions of words that nobody really understands. It's like, I'm against universal health care because health care comes from the earth, not from the universe. Stop living in comic books, people. That's an excerpt from my brand new book called The Case Against Universal Health Care, available for free to all my Patreon subscribers. When someone is making up convenient definitions for something or purposefully not defining the central concept of their book, that is a huge red flag that they're trying to manipulate you to get you to support or to reject something that you might not actually support or reject so easily if you knew what the actual definition of that thing was. This type of manipulation is completely rampant in politics, because unlike almost any other practical field, all of the main concepts in politics have no clear, universally understood definitions. They're all just big, fat, stupid words. Most people who work in astronomy or biology or engineering have clear functional definitions for the main concepts that they work with every day in their fields. Astronomers might have some disagreements about what the definitions of certain terms should be, like different opinions on where you should draw the line between a planet and a dwarf planet, or between a super-Earth and a mini-Neptune. But everyone in the field knows what the going definitions are, and they probably also know most of the main competing definitions as well. Even very abstract concepts like life and death have clear working definitions known to people who work in fields like biology or medicine. Meanwhile, most professional politicians and political science PhDs barely even know the definition of the word politics. And this has some extremely dangerous consequences. Like imagine that you're a surgeon, but instead of knowing precise anatomy terms or the proper names for your surgical tools, you just know a bunch of words like, uh, can you pass me that knife over there so I can make a cut in this guy's neck bone or something? Uh, no, not that knife, the other knife, like the bigger one. <laughs> oh, the neck bone connects to the chest bone. <laughs> If you don't have clear definitions for human anatomy, you are going to be a horrible surgeon, a Dr. Steve Brule class surgeon, and you are going to kill a lot of people. 
Even if you were some kind of intuitive surgery genius, and you could somehow magically know how all of the organs work using the Jedi Force or your midi chlorians, you'd still be a horrible surgeon, because it takes a team to do surgery, and everyone on the team needs to know the same definitions of all the body parts and all the tools that you're going to use so that they can work together. Now you probably don't realize it, because our political education is so terrible. But one of your main jobs as a human being walking around out there in the world is politics. And if you don't have a good grasp of basic political concepts, then you are walking around making a huge mess, just like a surgeon who doesn't know anatomy. I started this podcast and this video series because over and over I keep having the same conversations with people. Someone will tell me something like, everyone deserves to have good healthcare coverage, the system we have now is just an abomination. Or things like, we need to do something about these exploding rents. No one can even afford to live in this city anymore. And then the same person will turn around and tell me, that's why I'm voting for Genghis Khan. Like the guy who's going to chop their head off and hand it to their landlord on a silver platter so he can eat their brains and take a dump in their skull. I imagine you've had similar experiences with your friends and relatives. Political Jabba the Hutt and Darth Vader and Dracula are all running around out there taking advantage of the fact that people don't have solid definitions of political terms so that they can fill up those words with whatever meanings and associations that suit them. And this makes it so much easier for them to convince people to run straight off of a cliff and into their giant human sausage meat grinding machine. Like according to a recent article from Barron's, an investor's magazine, half of the growth of the Standard & Poor's Index, which tracks the stocks of the biggest U.S. corporations, half of the growth of these corporations since the early 2000s, and one-third of all current corporate profits, are the result of, quote, a redistribution of wealth away from labor and to capital, unquote. In other words, out of your pocket and into your employer's pocket. Now that is some straight-up political Dracula shit right there. And in part, that is the result of WURBS and lack of organization. Another dangerous consequence of WURBS is blindness. Take the word politics. Most people think that politics just means things relating to the government or to bickering political parties. Because when you learn about politics in school, or you watch or read news segments called politics, it's always about something relating to the government or to bickering political parties jockeying for power. And while that's a big part of politics, the actual definition of the word politics is anything relating to decision-making in groups. That's why we talk about things like office politics, people jockeying around to get promotions or to exert their decision-making power or their influence over the people who do have power in different ways. So when someone like Pete Buttigieg, the Democratic presidential primary candidate, says that he wants to choose, quote, non-political Supreme Court justices in order to, quote, stop the dissent of the Supreme Court and to becoming yet another political body, unquote, that's one of the most stupid things that a person can say. Because the literal job of any judge is to sit down and make decisions that affect groups of people all day long, i.e., politics. And this is even more true when it comes to the Supreme Court, an extremely political body whose decisions affect the entire country, not just a couple of litigants. The only non-political judge is a dead judge, and the only non-political person is a dead person. Even animals have politics, which we'll see in a future episode all about animal politics. Even slaves have politics, because even when you have no official decision-making power on paper, you can still exercise your power under the right conditions, as we'll see in future episodes. Now, it's not fair to judge Pete Buttigieg according to a definition of politics that he never learned. After all, he just went to Harvard and Oxford, where he graduated with honors in politics, and he was the president of the Student Advisory Committee of the Harvard Institute of Politics, so it's not his fault if he doesn't know anything about politics. But even if you use the definition that Mayor Peep had in his mind, like if you see his interview, you can see that what he means, like if you watch his interview, you can see that what he means is that he wants judges who are non-ideological and who quote-unquote think for themselves instead of along left or right ideological lines. But the word ideology means ideas about how the world should be based on ideas about human nature or how the universe works. If you're alive and you don't have an ideology, you're probably in a coma. And unless Mayor Pete wants more judges who are in a coma, what he really wants is judges who are ideological centrists, which is very much an ideological position, even if part of that ideology is thinking that you're a special, super-rational, independent thinker with no ideology. Anyhow, we'll look into all that when we do episodes on ideology and on the left-right political spectrum. But back to politics. 
You've got your public politics, which means decision-making involving the state, and you have your private politics, meaning every other kind of decision-making in groups. You have public law that the state makes, and you have private law called contracts that people make, and that the state enforces if you can afford good lawyers, or that you yourself can enforce if you can afford armed goons. So whether you're a Supreme Court justice making decisions for millions of people, or you're an employee taking orders from your boss at work all day, or you're just a person deciding where to eat with your friends, you are constantly engaging in politics. Someone who says, I'm not political, is actually saying, I let someone else make all of the important group decisions that affect my life. Because we don't learn the actual definition of the word politics, and because we limit our understanding of politics to the public government sphere, we also never learn that the same political concepts that we apply to the government also apply to politics in our private lives, and vice versa. Concepts like government, or democracy, or dictatorship. A government is a person or body that makes and enforces rules. So there's a public government running the state, which we call the government, but there are also all sorts of private governments in our lives. There's a private government in your home, and that's you if you own it, or it's your landlord if you're a tenant. And there's a private government in your workplace, and that's the owner and the management who tell the employees what to do all day. And there's also a private government when you and your friends are deciding where to go eat lunch, and that's you and your friends who are making and enforcing the decision together. And a government can be democratic, meaning that the people affected by decisions have a say in those decisions in proportion to how much they're affected by those decisions, like when you and your friends decide where to eat, or it can be dictatorial, meaning one person or one body gets to make decisions regardless of who's affected, like a slave owner making decisions for his slaves. Or it can be something in between, like the representative governments of most Western countries, where you get to have a say in choosing the people who'll be making decisions for you for several years at a time. Or like the capitalist workplace, where the boss tells you what to do all day and you have no say, except that you do have the option to leave, if material circumstances make that a viable option. Most of us want the governments of our nation states to be democratic. But because we only think of politics and government as things that involve the state, we never even think about whether or not we want the governments of our workplaces to be democratic. And we rarely discuss the fact that most of our workplaces are actually opt-out dictatorships. And we certainly never discuss workplace democracy versus workplace dictatorship in our political science courses or in the politics sections of newspapers or political websites. Now maybe you think that workplaces should be dictatorships, and there are all sorts of economic and even moral and ethical arguments for why that should be the case. But, our half-assed definition of the word politics makes us blind to even the possibility that workplaces don't have to be dictatorships, that they can actually be democratic. On the flip side, not knowing the definition of politics also makes us blind to how political principles from our private lives also apply to the public government sphere. Like most of us understand that at work, your bargaining power is what determines your wages. Like we know that dime a dozen workers with low bargaining power get low wages and crappy working conditions, and we know that rare, highly skilled workers with high bargaining power can negotiate higher wages and better working conditions. But because we don't think of the workplace as an arena of politics, we don't realize that when it comes to the state, the amount of rights and services that we get also reflects our bargaining power. As we'll see later, countries where people have more rights and more services are usually countries where the population has leveraged their bargaining power versus the state at some point in the not-too-distant past. Like how did women get the right to vote? Like how did women get the right to vote when they previously didn't have that right? And how come women in some parts of the world still don't have those rights? Or how did African Americans in the United States get all sorts of civil rights that they didn't previously have? Or how did ancient Athenians get democracy when most other societies at the time were monarchies and oligarchies? And why didn't Athenian democracy extend to all Athenians? Or why have Germans had universal health care for all wage workers since 1883, but Americans still don't have that today? As we'll see in future episodes, a huge part of the answer to these questions is bargaining power, having it and knowing how to use it. But in order to understand any of this, first you need to understand what the word politics actually means. When no one teaches you the definition of a word, you have to figure out what it means by inference, by seeing how other people use it. And this is a huge problem when you have a bunch of professional manipulators running around changing the meaning of words on purpose to fool us into supporting things that we don't actually like or want. 
Let's say you're a power-hungry maniac who wants dictatorial powers, and you're in a time and in a place where socialism is a very popular word that people like, but that they don't exactly know what it means. Like in much of Europe after World War II, where socialists and communists were very important in the resistance against the Nazis, and where the Soviet Union, which presented itself as the world flag bearer of socialism, played a decisive role in winning the war. Let's say you're a Romanian politician after World War II, and you're trying to grab dictatorial power for you and your buddies. And you're being supported in this endeavor by the Soviet Union, who killed off all of your competing socialist rivals, and who are helping you establish a one-party top-down dictatorship. You know that people like the idea of socialism, so you use the language and the imagery of socialism, and you associate it with you and your pals having dictatorial power. And you know that people don't like the idea of dictatorship, so you call your dictatorship a worker's democracy, or a people's democracy, so that all the peasants don't feel left out. Because everyone loves workers, and everyone identifies with the people, and everyone loves democracy, which is another word that nobody exactly understands. And then you twist the word democracy around to make it mean a dictatorship that cares about what workers need and want, even if workers have no actual say in anything. And you know that people don't want to be controlled or exploited by a foreign power, so you explain that the USSR isn't a foreign power that's exploiting us, it's our big brother, who defeated Hitler, and who's helping us achieve international socialism. And what's international socialism? Well, it's you and your buddies in power, waving red flags and talking about workers a lot, propped up by the Soviet Union. And you associate all of this with images that people like, like progress and civilization and fairness and the national flag and democracy and the people and workers and robots and freedom and sugar and spice and everything nice. Meanwhile, if you're around at this time and you actually know what socialism is, then you'd be listening to this with alarm bells going off and you'd be thinking, wait a minute, isn't this the exact opposite of socialism? Which is what people like socialist George Orwell were saying about the Soviet Union and its satellite states at that time, which you can read about in his 1947 preface to Animal Farm. And it's also what a lot of socialists who had visited Bolshevik Russia in the late 19-teens and early 1920s were saying, when Lenin and Trotsky started turning the struggling revolutionary state into a centralized top-down dictatorship. And you can find some of their critiques online, like communist Rosa Luxemburg's essay, The Russian Revolution from 1918, or anarchist Emma Goldman's books, My Disillusionment in Russia, and My Further Disillusionment in Russia, which are from 1923 and 1924. Now we'll explore socialism in depth in future episodes, but the point of all this is that when people don't really know the meaning of certain words, they infer the meaning of those words from people that they identify with. Political psychology studies since the 1960s show us that the less information that we have, the more we rely on things like identity and social cues to shape our political opinions. Social cues are things like how people dress, what they look like, how they speak, and what buzzwords they use. And these cues serve as shortcuts to figure out which policies we support. You can read about this in recent books like Can Democracy Work? or Democracy for Realists, or in a 1964 book called The Nature of Belief Systems in Mass Publics, which you can find online. If you do read these books, keep in mind that I'm not endorsing the conclusions of these books. We'll talk about that research and my critiques of these books when we do episodes on democracy and political psychology. A great example of people voting based on social cues versus based on policy is the 2020 Democratic presidential primary race in the United States. Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden are two candidates at the opposite ends of the political spectrum, in terms of their records, their policies, their donors, and their beliefs. Yet, polls show that a big chunk of Bernie voters choose Biden as their second choice candidate, and a big chunk of Biden voters choose Bernie as their second choice candidate. The only thing that these two guys have in common is that they're two old white guys with gruff voices, and that seems to have been the deciding factor for a lot of their supporters. And you have a similar phenomenon with Elizabeth Warren voters who choose Kamala Harris or P.D. Buttigieg as their second choice, and vice versa, even though Warren has way more in common with Bernie in terms of their policies. Now the same thing that we talked about in terms of manipulating the popularity of the word socialism also applies to the word capitalism in North America today. Let's say you're a big employer and you don't want to have to pay taxes and you want to be able to pay your workers as little as their bargaining power commands without any stupid minimum wage laws getting in the way. And of course, you also want to be able to make your employees pee and poop in their diapers. Diapers that they have to pay for themselves. That way they won't steal your profits by wasting time on their selfish bathroom breaks. Well, a society based entirely on the rules of capitalism allows you to do all of these wonderful things. 
so long as the bargaining power of your workers is low enough. So you definitely want people to support capitalism, but you also know that a lot of people are just selfish and unreasonable, and they don't want to dump in their diapers at work every day. So what you do is, you take advantage of the fact that nobody really knows what capitalism is, and you talk about capitalism in a way that leads people to infer that it means a bunch of things that you know that people do like, like freedom, and democracy, and prosperity. And you make sure that you just never really explain what capitalism is. Let people just fill in the blanks with whatever they like. Remember Alan Greenspan, who I mentioned earlier, who wrote the glowing book about capitalism in America, where he forgets to define what capitalism actually is? Well, Alan Greenspan doesn't believe in a minimum wage. And neither does Senator Rand Paul, who wrote The Case Against Socialism. And his book also raves about how great capitalism is without ever defining it. Rand Paul takes advantage of the fact that people don't know what capitalism or socialism are in order to get his readers to oppose anything that interferes with the rights of property owners, which is what his political career and his libertarian ideology are fundamentally about, which you can see from his writings and his speeches and his voting record and everything he ever says and does. Whether it's socialism or government regulations or even democracy, which Paul criticizes at one point in his book, if it interferes with property rights, he hates it and he wants you to hate it too. So whatever you hate, dictators, poverty, the Holocaust, brown pants, doggy doo-doos on your shoes, that's socialism. And whatever you like, freedom, democracy, prosperity, your family, your neighborhood, your country, your ice cream, your baby Jesus, that's capitalism. And if you happen to like things like atheism, pornography, and abortions, well, that's capitalism too. And if you hate that stuff, well, then it's socialism. Guy, whatever you want, I'm selling it, bro. Just don't interfere with the rights of property owners. The End by Rand Paul In the same vein, let's take a look at Democratic presidential primary candidate Mike Bloomberg, who is the 11th richest human being on planet Earth, and his definition of dictatorship. Many of Mike's zillions come from investments made in China, which according to an interview he recently gave on PBS, is not a dictatorship. Why isn't China a dictatorship? Even though it's functionally a one-party state where the ruler has supreme dictatorial power over the country and the government and the one party? Because, says Mike Bloomberg, quote, no government survives without the will of the majority of its people, unquote. Nice. By that definition, Hitler and Stalin and Mussolini and Genghis Khan and Nero and General Zod, not dictators. So, According to mega-capitalist Mike Bloomberg, dictatorship is actually democracy if the dictator says he's acting on behalf of the people. In other words, capitalist Mike Bloomberg has exactly the same definition of democracy as Stalin. Ladies and gentlemen, the power of words. Obviously, the real reason that Bloomberg doesn't call China a dictatorship is because the rulers of China like to pretend that China isn't a dictatorship. It's a people's republic and a people's democratic dictatorship. And you can look up the definitions of those terms online, and basically they mean And if Bloomberg called China a straight-up dictatorship, then the leaders of China might get angry with him, and they might harm his widow investments, which is what the Chinese government does to people who piss them off. The reality is that everyone in every era uses the popular words of the day to get us to support things that we are actually against. The malleable definition of words also helps politicians turn us into antagonistic tribes of mindless hooting apes who can be whipped up into hating our fellow humans, with whom we share many common political goals. Because without definitions, words are just identity groups. And this is why if you talk to people today who think that they support socialism, and you talk to people who think that they support capitalism, two fundamentally opposed ideologies, you'll find out that most of them tend to want a lot of the same things. Freedom, democracy, healthcare, a job where you don't have to poo in your diapers, a nice environment, prosperity, sugar, spice, things that are nice. So you have zillions of people who want a lot of the same things, divided into opposing camps, deleting each other on Facebook and making fun of each other on Reddit, instead of working together on those issues that they have in common. So what we're going to do with this podcast is we're going to turn words into words so that you can become an effective political actor, participating in the major decisions that affect your life, and able to reach out to other people who share the same goals as you do. But of course, every single person listening out there knows that you're the exception. You're not being manipulated. You know who's lying to you. You understand politics, not like all those other dum-dums out there. Okay, 
Congratulations, Dr. Professor Einstein, but you still want to listen to this podcast, because much like the Jedi Surgery Ninja that I talked about earlier, even if you understand everything, you still need to learn how to communicate with all those other non-Dr. Professor Einsteins out there. Because politics is inherently mass teamwork, and you're going to need to work with other people if you want to accomplish any of your goals. So on top of fleshing out coherent definitions of these concepts, we're also going to go over all of the conflicting, confused, or incorrect definitions that other people have in their heads, so that you can understand what and how other people think, so that you're able to communicate with them. Because if you know all of the correct hip and cool definitions and terms, but the people you're speaking to don't, you just become an ineffective, extremely annoying, gibber-spewing asshole. We're also going to spend time explaining the history of these concepts, where they come from, how they evolved, how they've been used and abused over time, so you can see for yourself why I'm picking one particular definition over other ones, or why in some cases I'll even be putting forth my own definition. That way you can decide for yourself how you want to use and understand these terms, even if that differs from how I want you to use and understand these terms. I have very strong political opinions, and ideally I'd love it if everyone shared those opinions. But when it comes to this podcast, I don't care whether you agree with me or not. First and foremost, I want you to have the tools necessary to decide for yourself what you believe and who you believe. I want you to be able to disagree with me or agree with me because you actually understand what I'm saying, not because I said some trigger words that caused your brain to implode and to see me as the enemy, or that set off your serotonin receptors because I'm telling you what you want to hear. And very importantly, I want to train your brain to demand precise definitions when you hear someone using political words, instead of just filling in the blanks according to whether or not that person dresses like you or talks like you. What does that guy mean by freedom? What does she mean when she calls herself a democratic socialist? When that person invokes democracy or the people or calls someone a globalist or a nationalist, what are they actually trying to do? Okay, if you... Be, if you be, Okay, if you've been listening to a few episodes of this, and you like what I'm doing, and you want me to keep on doing it, please rate and review the podcast on iTunes, which is important because it increases the visibility of this podcast. Please check out the What Is Politics YouTube channel, and like and subscribe, and press the little bell thingy so that you get notified when a new episode comes out. And comment on the videos, or ask me questions, or argue with me in the comments, which is both fun, bad for your high blood pressure, and it increases the visibility of the videos. And if you can afford to, please help me out on the What Is Politics Patreon page, so that I can keep making time to do this labor-intensive project. If you have trouble finding What Is Politics on YouTube, or on your podcast app because the name is a bit generic, then just search for Worldwide Scrotes, all one word and it'll come up first thing, and you'll see why if you visit the YouTube channel. What I'll do for Patreon subscribers is that I'll do special subscriber episodes where I answer your questions and address your corrections and your arguments about the content of the main lecture episodes. Most importantly, please, please, please tell other people about this podcast. Post about it on Reddit or on Facebooks and share it with your e-friends or your real-life carbon-based human friends. This podcast is a very labor and research intensive project. So if I'm going to keep devoting hours and hours of work to this on a regular basis, ideally I need some financial support so that I can keep making time for it. But more importantly, I need to know that there are enough people out there who are listening and who care about what I'm doing to make it worthwhile to keep going. Okay. So until next time, see ya. <laughs>